if you have your Bibles, John chapter 4, lengthy reading, so I want to get moving on it and get it read and get you so you're comfortable and seated in this nice air-conditioned building with these padded chairs and carpet. Some of y'all had rough days and you worked real hard and you're absolutely, absolutely exhausted and spent. Hallelujah. But God is still worthy. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up. Well, I, I will hurt nobody's feelings, but I think you stagnated a little bit, some of the people around here. Ain't nothing springing up out of you in the dog's age. Except maybe an off-handed comment. Can we just be real tonight for just a few minutes? Some critique, some complaint. But when's the last time you just really got beside yourself despite aches and pains and problems and issues, just lift up your hands and let it flow right out of your worship and praise and honor and glory and with reckless abandon realize I serve a great God and I want him to know I've come to worship. Now, I don't want to tell on us people that like vehicles and motors and all that, but every now and then, Brother Terry, you got an engine you got a little bit done to. You better get that bad boy out on the highway and open it up. <laughs> well, some of y'all like that old engine has been sitting in the back. Rings are stuck. And done. Mud daubers has got nests inside some of the hoses of Rats got up there and chewed so You've been sitting so long and ain't been out on the open spiritual road and been all in on worship and praise that that well ain't springing up and things is a little stagnated. Is that okay? Springing up into everlasting life. You see, we got to know that you're alive. Well, I can preach right there. There's some stories about people being trapped. And recently I've been doing some studying about people when they died, they were so afraid of death to be buried alive. They literally put windows in coffins, brother. They did, John, Brother Jonathan. They literally had chains and ropes going to bells that they could pull on the inside in case they wake. I'm listening for some bells tonight. Come on, come on, Pastor. I'll be looking in the windows of your coffin to see if. Maybe you'll shake yourself and wake yourself. Hello. Hello. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. See, here, that just proved to you, some of you. So, you know, like Jesus gets down in your business. Now, I know pastor's not supposed to, but I don't know if I'm not preaching something you need, what, what the purpose of, I am. Well, my car's running fire, and I ain't taking it to the mechanic except for an oil change. <laughs> I come to church, I'm going, I got some things I got to get fixed tonight. I'm the preacher, and you know what? I need to work better on my worship, my praise. I'm up here, and I keep me in your prayers. I haven't been able to lift my head all the way up now for about two weeks. I was looking at all them Easter pictures. I just look kind of bowed up and still up. I'm not getting a hump back. I just got a disc or something, and I got an appointment, and the doctor's going to, whatever they're going to do, but I'm not going to allow the fact that I can't worship like I want to to stop me from worshiping at all. All right, then let's get on our lesson tonight. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Right now. <laughs> Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. What? Did he just say that right out in the open? Listen, if we would get real when we come to the court, come into his courts, if we did, you know what? 
I'll just let you all know, I did not come in here perfected tonight. I came in there with some issues. He's getting right in her business. We are his business. If you go home and I say, man, he preached all over me. Don't thank me, thank him. And on the other side, don't get mad at me. Thank him. Either way. <laughs> and then you go home and thank God. Well, I'm glad Brother Crow's listening to God. If I ain't never stepped on your toes, something's wrong. Either you're in serious denial or I'm afraid of you. <laughs> Y'all know that ain't true. <laughs> All right, well, that's, and the woman said, uh, the, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive, I bet you perceive <laughs> that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship? Jesus saith unto woman, Believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. There's something fixing to happen. There's a revelation there. I ain't got time to get into tonight. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus put a must in there. Kind of like Nicodemus got a must. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the love that this word is delivered in. Help each and every one of us get to that place. No matter what we face or gone through, what we gain or what we lose that we build a pillar of unreserved worship in our life, that we never allow ourselves to get to that place where the things of this life hew down, remove, or crumble that pillar of worship that we need to make it. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. God bless you. You may be seated. Again, we know that storms of life come to all of us. And I say here at this point, trust me, Whatever it was or whatever it is that's keeping you from that place of worship. All throughout scripture, if you pay attention, there's always someone who's had it worse and didn't lose their worship. I, 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 know, we, I know we don't like to say that, and I'll be the first one to tell you, your hurt is real. But so is God, so continue to worship. Scriptures tells us storms will come. And those two builders that we've referenced out of the book of Matthew, each built a house, each experienced a storm. Being a believer in God does not exempt you or I or anyone from a storm. The storms come. But one house stood and one house fell. Now, we're not talking just about this metaphorical house. We're talking about our lives. In order to maintain your worship, you got to be building the right house. If you lose your worship, you built wrong somewhere. Because the only difference indicated scripturally was the foundation underneath them. You see, the wise man heard the word of God and obeyed. The foolish heard the word of God and ignored. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 still says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Can anybody learn anything tonight? Can anybody change your thinking here tonight? Can anybody have their worship and praise and honor of God restored? I, I hope we all can. Because it's interesting to note that the foundation or that unseen part of the building. Let me tell you, 
If you, you don't know what I've been through, I don't need to know. That's the hidden part. Your foundation should still be about worship. The foundation is in that painted, dressed up part. And so it's often overlooked. So let me tell you something. When it comes to the house of God, sit me next to a worshiper. Sit me next to something. I don't mind, man, I like sitting next to my wife. She's a worshiper. She ain't a funny daddy. She ain't just going to sit there. She don't give a rip if I'm standing or what I'm running or that. She's going to worship God. I'm going to tell you something, young people. You're going to marry a worshiper. Don't measure a, a dead lump on a dill pickle. Don't go get next to that lump. If they can't worship God, run. There will be times in life that it's only going to be worship that's going to get you through. So tonight we're discussing that, that, that outward manifestation of our true love for God. And it's never made more evident or revealed than in our corporate worship. There's a right way, there's a wrong way. We must worship in a way that pleases God. Or it's not his worship. It's your ship. And we're talking about his ship. Hear me. You can't do it the way you want to. If that was true, Cain would have been fine. Cain would have been just fine. See, sadly, all those years ago, mankind has been so good at telling you, you just come to church, I yard, just do all this, do whatever you want, and you're going to be just fine. Good God, I'm thankful someone didn't convince me of that. My foundation mattered, and I'm only here today because I was built on a foundation of truth. The word still declares that he, Paul said, I would that all men everywhere would lift up without, I can't do that without, lift up your hands for a minute. He said that there's some activity that goes in worship. There's some action in what you can't say. I'm worshiping God. It's funny. You're still shopping. You're still going to the grocery store. You're, you're still driving a car. Just, but where'd your worship go? I retired my worship. I don't feel good. I'm going through something right now. Well, we need to look at the foundation tonight. We have to take notice of our foundation. Because if we're going to stay in the storms of life, we have to keep a deep commitment to being doers of the word of God. Worship and obedience are the true prevention medications, if you will, against the plague of bitterness and stagnation or deadness. I don't like sitting next to dead people. Are you hearing me? So built into every structure or our spiritual house as it was, there needs to be some pillars. Like per Proverbs 9 and 1, we talk about wisdom hath built in her house. Wisdom knows I need to worship. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. So tonight, I need to make sure I have an unreserved worship. There just comes a time when I don't need to be reserved. You walk into a funeral, be reserved. But you walk into church, be unrestrained. You can't tell me God don't like someone who's all in. Ah, let me help some of y'all. Young ladies, if a guy comes up to you and say, hey, this other girl wouldn't go out with me. Would you like to go out? Run from that jerk. Let me tell you something. I said something earlier. Now it comes out. If you've worked all day and you're busy and you're tired and you come in here, you're saying, I had something else, God. Sometimes with achy arms and a, a neck that barely allows a knee. A, you're going to do it anyway. Why? Not because I like it, but because he likes it.
And so we, we've preached about four pillars. But tonight, adding the fifth pillar to this series, we need the pillar of unreserved worship. You don't find God searching for too many things in Scripture. We all understand that he sought us and found us and bought us to save us. But besides that, we don't find too many incidences where the Lord is described as searching for something or someone. We know that he came looking for Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. We know that in Genesis 18, he was looking for 10 righteous souls and sought him to spare it. In Isaiah 6, he's looking for a man to send for him. And, but there are rare incidents. However, in John 4, our text, we read of an encounter between Jesus and a woman of low moral character. I, I said that, and I want us to think about that because he goes to her to find a worshiper, and some of us, we ain't done near that much, and we sit there. She'd been married multiple times. And here's Jesus coming to her. I know y'all don't think they can be saved, but she's currently living with a man outside of marriage, and Jesus came to her. Why would he come to her? She was a searching woman. There's a danger in getting satisfied with the things of this life. You stop searching. Some of you got so much, you don't think you need God. And you've tricked yourself right out of that pillar of worship in your life. You throw God a bone now and then, but that exuberant worship's turned to a stagnated pond. She's startled by Jesus' knowledge of her condition and acknowledges him as a prophet. She attempts to draw some lines, but between the Jews and the Samaritans. But Jesus dispels that thinking, and he simply says that what God is looking for is worshipers. Jesus uses this moment, thinks he's looking for a worshiper. If, if you realize tonight, we're all sitting here, but God's eyes are going to and fro because he's looking for a worshiper. Uh, you can say names and occupations. God looks past all that. He's looking for a worshiper. Uh, 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 he's looking past backgrounds. And sometimes that's all you see. He's looking past nationalities, and sometimes we get stuck on that. He, he's looking past your, 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 your religious pedigree, your heritage, your race, your creed. God's not looking for any of that. He's looking for a worshiper. Of all the things he's looking for, he's enamored with a worshiper. You see, hear me. It's not hard to find someone that wants something from God. That's what makes God looking for a worshiper because he's looking for anyone looking to give to him. I, we say it. How many know God's been good to you? Can we take a moment right now and be good to him? One. One. Two. Two. See, see, see. Come on, come on. I'm not going ahead. He's looking for worshipers. He's seeking worshipers. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Let me, let me say this to you. This is a song that came out not, well, I've gotten old since it came out. Guy riding in an elevator, he, the title, What If I Said Jesus Out Loud? Reminded of a story of an auditorium where this atheist uh, speaker got up and spent an hour speaking about how it's impossible for God to exist. And he, and he ran and he ran God down for so long. And finally, this precious lady sitting about where you were, Sister Crystal, just stood up and started singing, Oh, how I love Jesus, all by herself. She stood and just started singing. Uh, and next year, someone over there joined her. And then someone joined her. And, and the professor's getting irate. And pretty soon another and another and another. And pretty soon the whole place was singing. And that professor, you don't, cannot tell me that worship and being demonstrative don't matter. That's what God is seeking. I encourage you. I know you've got stuff, but be a worshiper. If you're sick, then be a sick worshiper. If you're tired, be a tired worshiper. If you're broke, be a broke worshiper. If you're young, be a young worshiper. If you're old, be an old worshiper. But be a worshiper. No matter what other things you may be, be a worshiper because that's what God is always looking for. We must never lose our passion for a deep, heartfelt, consuming worship. And let me say this, if you've never been there, you don't know what you're missing. You don't. You don't know what you're missing. But trust me, you're missing. There are many attributes to worship. There are worship at times that drives me to my feet. There are, there are times, and I... I I know I get in trouble for doing it, but Sister Jessica, I guess there's something about it when you're singing a verse. There's something about when Sister Jessica, she's been through a whole lot of stuff, but when she's singing a verse, uh, she's not just singing to sound good. It comes from here, and she breaks when she's singing. That just makes me want to worship God because when I see another worshiper, I understand uh, there's a kindred. Ah, yeah. God is so good. I get it. I get it. I get it. There are times when we just, I got to stand to my feet. And I know that there are times and I've been, been, I've been serving God 38 years. There have been times that worship has sent me to my face. There are times when worship is verbal and physical. And sometimes it's introspective and Intensely personal. Times when it's spontaneous and times when it's intentional. There are times I come in here and I'm so upset at what's gone on. I've told the enemy and I've told that situation, I'm going to worship anyway. I'm not worshiping because I feel anything. I'm not worshiping because that's my favorite song. I'm not worshiping. I'm wor because he's worthy. And I refuse to allow anything to steal that pillar of worship in my life. There's just got to be something about us. I'll have that pillar of worship. 
Regardless, I will be a worshiper. Not because I like, I like how it makes me feel. Not because it's another religious exercise. Not because everything in my life is just how I like it. And not because God has given me everything on my daily wish list. I worship regardless of, regardless of anything else. Because God is always worthy. Yes. That was anticlimactic. Because your flesh and your mind, some of you said, no, he's not. Because you equate what man has done to you as God allowing it. You blame God. Brother Joe, be real easy. Some of the stuff we've been through. Why would he even let me do that? Because people did something. It'd be very easy for me to be upset at God because my dad was killed. What? Well, why would God allow that? Well, you know, my dad chose to go down there and to work, and he chose to do what he did. He made that, he, he made that conscious choice to do it on his own. I wasn't a part of that equation. So I'm not going to make God pay for what someone chose to do, whether it's a loved one or not. I, I can't turn around in a world where God, God how many of us choose what we're going to do? And you're going to blame God because someone did something or you lost a loved one or we're going to blame God for it? Wait a minute. Cain, if thou this wealth, shalt thou not be accepted? Yeah. You know he didn't say anything to Abel and Abel did exactly what he should do? And the next thing we find out, what happened to Abel? Somebody did something. Thank God he had been a worshiper before. Any, anybody get that? I want to worship God regardless because he's always worthy regardless of anybody or anything else. Psalms 18 and 3 declares, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. It's really that simple. We worship him together in this place because he's worthy of it. And if you're here tonight and you don't think he's worthy of it, the devil's done a number on you. You've opened the door and you allowed the devil to come sit at your table. You've entertained thoughts where you have ought against God. Now, wait a minute. Hold on a minute. I've been there, done that. Some of you, you've been stuck for years. Can you imagine that if you'd hate the devil and not hate the church? What would change in your life? If you'd hate sin and love the sinner, what would happen to you? If you'd be more critical about your godly standards instead of somebody else's where you could. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Every time we show up into this house, regardless what's ever happened here, he's worthy. He's looking and he's building a body of worshipers. He's looking for a group who will worship him regardless, not because the right song choice, not because the folks up front do it just right. I can tell you he's here right now looking for worship. You, I know you came to church, but he came too, and he's looking for worshipers. He's looking in your row right now. He's looking in your section of seating right now. He's looking in your chair. Will he find a worshiper in your seat tonight? Worship speaks of devotion. Mm. 
How good would it be to stand before God knowing you stayed faithful in your marriage the whole time, but you didn't stay faithful to God? You got bragging rights with all divorced people, but now you're in trouble when you face company ain't quite as good as you thought it was going to be, is it now? Well, oh, I won't, I won't, I won't marry divorced people. <laughs> Here's Jesus sitting with a well with a lathe. Some of y'all missed it. Oh, I don't think you'd be a preacher if you've been divorced. <laughs> you see, worship speaks of devotion. In fact, he got so upset at Israel, he had to divorce Israel for us. Are there any worshipers today? Because, boy, if he didn't have that altercation, we'd be on the outside looking in. You know, praise may be offered in response to something he has been done that, that has been done. We are told to praise him for his mighty acts. Well, we constantly praise others for their accomplishments. Lacey, you graduate. Couple, couple days. <laughs> Booyah! That's awesome! That's an accomplishment. I'm going to throw, I'm gonna throw a wet blanket on it, though. Awesome. You just com completed and graduated the easiest part of your life. Don't let them lie to you. But, but young lady, you are ready to take on the world. You see, praise can be spread around. Worship cannot. Yeah, y'all thought I was playing. Y'all thought I was getting off on it. No. You can praise many things. But you better only worship one. It's a sad day. You can come in here and you your dogs are tired, but you go out and you go to a family gathering and boy, man, you blitzing and going, shopping. Oh, wait a minute. It's time to go fishing. I can't get up and make for prayer before I can make it to go fishing. Hey, I've been, I've been, ha I've been showing up for prayer for a long time based on that one. <laughs> I don't want to be a hypocrite. Well, I can get up early, go to a car show. I can. I can stay up late, work up. I think I've been over there working at 2 o'clock in the morning. But you jokers preach till 2 o'clock in the morning, I'll have your hide. <laughs> Worship speaks of devotion, so there's a difference. Worship speaks of commitment. Worship speaks of service. And worship speaks of his lordship. Because God will not tolerate his people having misplaced worship. Exodus 34 and 14, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. He is seeking worshipers who with reckless abandon will give their words, their strength, their time, their very lives in devotion to an exaltation of his great name. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to shoot from the hip here. I can't help it. I'm reminded of a worldly psalm. In fact, I believe Meatloaf died sometime just recently. And he sang the song, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. You have to understand something. You can do a lot of things, but there's one thing you can't do. I will not worship anything else. I will not give actions, effort, resources, finances to something greater than what I give to God. Oh, boy, I tell you what, I, there's been some times I done got myself on the wrong side of my hobbies and habits. I found myself saving and doing this and doing that because I want to pour a whole lot in and I turn around and, hey, God, I love you. No, you don't. You're lavishing that and I'm languishing over here in a pittance that you throw here or there and a little bit of time here and there on your scheduled services. And you want me to follow you around like a puppy dog. 
He's looking for unreserved worship. I need to build that pillar back in my life. There's a good description of what it means in Psalms 95. Worship revolves around and involves rejoicing. Everybody says that hurts. I like to re in front of that. Rejoice. Do it again. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills are his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Don't ever let anybody ever tell you that worship does not involve an element of excitement and exuberance because it absolutely does. We are being biblical when we rejoice, when we celebrate, when we run, when we dance, when we stand, when we lift up our hands, when we run, when we shout praises to God. That is Bible. That's not Pentecost. It's Bible. That's not apostolic. It's Bible. It just happens at Pentecost an apostolic stays with the Bible. So worshiping and dancing and shouting, it's biblical. The clapping of our hands and the lifting of our hands and the lifting of our voices, these are spiritual, scriptural directives. It's not all in the emotion. And it's not all in the sit in, sitting there and watching either. You are given an emotional nature by your heavenly father and he does expect us to spend that on him. I'll never forget, I, I had one of the most stoic saints in all the world in the first church that I pastored. I, lo I loved him dearly, spent a lot of time and a lot, of, probably more effort on him than anyone. And every service, I can't believe they're praising and worshiping like that. I can't believe this. And, that. and it was always pointing at the, the, the shouters and the dancers, the broke people. See, he had a little money in his pocket. And every time he turned around, man, I can't. How can they shout when their life looks like that? And how can. They? And then one day, right up at the front of the altar, someone walked by and dropped some money. And he picked it up and did a jig right in front of the whole church and everybody. And I was like, you see, you can worship. It's just when it's about something you worship. Mm. I know we have different personalities. Thank God. We're not all going to be alike. But if we're not careful, we'll use that old, I'm not emotional as an excuse for our pride, which is the real reason why we don't demonstratively worship him. Because worship involves rejoicing. Yes. Worship is collective. Three times in the verse one and two, we read where it says, let us. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise. <laughs> While worship does and should have a private element to it throughout the week, I hope you worshiped this week. What the psalmist here is stating is that worship is designed to be congregational and not merely individual. Worship is vocal. No, I'm telling you how wonderful you are. I just didn't say it out loud. He knows my heart, you lying dog. Worship is vocal, but sadly some people think of worship as not only private, but silence as well. 
that stagnant water don't make a sound either. It's that rushing water that does. While we may worship God in our heart and even sing quietly, God is longing for worshipers to sing out to him. Worship is vibrant. It's vigorous. Worship is being wrapped up and focused on something. I, let me tell you something. I said this to someone the other day. Choose your noise. The Bible says in hell there's going to be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. I don't think it's going to be quiet down there. But in heaven, they're going to be singing praises and throwing. Like, I don't think it's really quiet there. You better pick your noise. You better pick your noise, folks. You, you got to find out. Put me with the worshipers. <laughs> Put me with the worshipers. Worship is vibrant and it's vigorous. Worship is being wrapped up and focused on something. While we are to participate with a joyful, grateful, thankful praise and to be exuberant in our worship. That's why it's worship. I can talk to you about the lady who came into the Pharisee's house, broke the ointment, and worshiped. Maybe I'll get into that in a minute because Jesus said, look what she's done and you sat here. You ain't done jack for me. That's a paraphrase. Don't come into this church and get dead. Trust me, you'll do that at your funeral. You won't move a muscle. You won't say a word. You won't shout. I tell you what, while I got breath in my body and when I come to the house of God, I'm going to be a worshiper. I'm going to be building that unreserved pillar of worship. Now, go worthy. I got breath in my body. I got physical ability in my life. I lift up my voice. Understand that 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 in that in that verse in Psalms, those terms employed here describe activity, which seems to some to be more appropriate at a Cardinals football game than in the church sanctuary. The phrase "sing for joy" in verse one could literally be translated shout for joy. When we are told to shout aloud in the second half of verse 1, the Hebrew literally means to raise a shout. This was done when the Israelites were anticipating battle or celebrating a triumph. The same expression was used in Joshua 6.20 when the Israelites were marching around the walls of Jericho. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted. At the sound of the trumpet, and when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. The reason why you might be all hemmed in. <laughs> or you might be shut out. Is you better, better be a worshiper. Again, it's also found in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 4, verse 5, where we read about what happened when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the camp. All Israel raised such a great shout. The Bible says the ground shook. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. Church, I'm telling you, I believe <laughs> as New Testament redeemed, Holy Ghost filled people filled with the Spirit of God that our praise should be as vibrant and as vigorous, if not more, than what they did in the Old Testament. They didn't have what we got. Oh, you're messing with the wrong preacher. You better get up. You better wake up. You better find out that, oh, I ain't dead yet. I ain't dead yet. I ain't dead yet. I still got to shout. I still got to pray. I got to, he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. There's a place in scripture Whereas they worshiped, as they praised, and the singer said, up the cloud of glory of God came down, and it said ambushments. You want to see some problems disappear? You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Uh, when we come together, oh, Thank God for the Brother Joes and the Brother Glories and the Jessicas and the Shouters and the Singers and the Praisers 
And those that are lift up their voice, yeah, put me next to a worshiper. You see, forgive me. Keep me seated. I'm not done. You see, I'm not really worried about wildfire, things getting out of control. Before service, I told Sister Erica something. I said, just do this. I'll just tell you my secret. I don't care. I'm not trying to be tricky or if someone gets all exuberant in praise and worship and they're trying to dominate the service, I should cut the music. Let's see how real it is. And see, I got the next step after that because if someone's doing that service, I'll say the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Sit down. <laughs> I'm preaching right now. God doesn't interrupt himself. I, I dare some of you. And some say, oh, they're so spiritually minded, no, no earthly good. I've yet to meet that person. But I've met a whole lot of earthly people that are no spiritual good. I'm talking about the church. I've been preaching for many years. I've preached on a lot of subjects, but it never fails when I've preached on praise and worship like this. There will be someone whose spirit stinks. Many times they'll come up and say, you know, you don't have to do all that to be saved. Let me tell you how you respond to that, folks. You don't have to take a shower either, but it feels good and it makes you more pleasant to be around. <laughs> I can tell you, there's some folks sure could use a good shower, if you know what I mean. Be very careful about being critical of others whose worship is. More enthusiastic or animated than yours. I know I know there are extremes that we should avoid. Ladies, if you're wearing a skirt, please don't do handstands. If you fall back, sir, remove the jacket, put it in the right. Really? Just housekeeping. It's okay. I never want someone to be fettered in their worship, but, you know, we've got to use a little sense. And though I know there are some extremes, very few of us have even come close to being too passionate. The danger is to react against such worship, much like Michael disdained David for his joyful enthusiasm in 2 Samuel chapter 6. You see, in verse 12, when David brought the ark into Jerusalem, he did it with rejoicing. Verse 14 tells us that he danced before the Lord with all his might. You see, see, some of you think, well, I don't know if God was moving on. It doesn't matter. You know, he called Lazarus to come forth. And he's the only one that did. There may be a reason you're not moving either. It says that his worship was filled with shouts and the sound of trumpets. When Michael, who was Saul's daughter, saw David leaping and dancing with the Lord, verse 16 says, she despised him in her heart. David responded by saying that he was focused only on the Lord when he was expressing himself in worship. What's your focus tonight? In the last part of verse 21, he says, I will celebrate before the Lord. David didn't care how it looked to others because he was intent on fully engaging himself in wholehearted worship. Now, no, no, no. He wasn't problem free. He had problems which turned him back into a You see, if you'll let go of what's holding you back. Oh, I believe there's some people got some resurrection power to their worship tonight. Ah. I, I, I still believe you can raise the dead tonight. <laughs> oh, I wonder tonight collectively if we express our worship locally with, with vibrance and exuberance and we, we are supposed to sing songs of praise and we should shout a joyful shout with gratitude for the rock of our salvation. Oswald Chambers puts it 
A joyful spirit is the nature of God in my blood. <laughs> when God himself so penetrates our life that we are consumed by a desire to worship him, we can't help but break out in joyful praise. Hey, this, this is for your litmus test. You need to find out where you're really at. Worship is God-centered. You'll find the opposite is self-centered. So this is a good reminder because we are not to just get emotional or sing loudly for our own sake. Our focus should not be on how worship makes us feel. Our worship must be centered on God alone how it makes him feel. Notice these two verses in Psalms 95. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise in the name of Psalms. You see, we are to sing for joy to the Lord. We are to shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. We are to come before him with thanksgiving. We are to extol him with music and song. David danced and shouted, but he did it before the Lord. The Lord is the center of his rejoicing. Because rejoicing involves reverence. Ooh, reverence. Oh, come let us worship and bow down. Psalms 95, 6 and 7. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Mm. Oh, you ain't a self-made man. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. If you notice, there's a change in the tone here from enthusiastic and loud songs of joy to awe-inspired reverence and humility before God. We are called to move from praise to prostration. In verses 1 and 2, the worshiper stands in God's presence shouting for praise. And now in verse 6, the worshiper falls on his face before God in humble silence. You see, worship involves both. Animated, demonstrative rejoicing and speechless reverence. The fact that this is the fact that should lead us to a place of such reverence is that he is our maker and he is our shepherd. We are a flock under his care and the people of his pasture. God is our loving shepherd who pays close attention to each one of us Personally, like you watch your children and you're aware. God is very aware. That should cause each of us to bow down and worship and kneel before the Lord, our master. Bowing and kneeling helps us to get low before God, which is really the essence of deep worship. We accept our place before him while acknowledging his place above us. That relationship forms the basis of our reverence of him. Listen carefully, experiencing God's caring hand in our lives should induce us to a greater submission and reverence. Those who have little reverence for God may also have little intimacy with him. As I stated, it's easy to critique the exuberant praiser, but it's dangerous for that person to never bow. But also noise does not equal intimacy. And in fact, sometimes excitement becomes a drug to numb us from the spiritual hunger that should drive us to get closer to him. There's a balance, but you need both. I can testify that when I look over my life, the greatest, most profound moments of spiritual change in me were not produced in a moment of shouting and dancing. Those profound times happened when I was completely humbled and even broken in his presence. 
that place when I knew I really had nothing to offer. And I know that he still loved me. When I knew that I deserved none of his goodness. And yet this magnificent God cared about me. Which brings us to worship involves response. The last words of verse 7 are, Today if you will hear his voice. Tonight if you will hear his voice. One rendering says it this way, drop everything and listen. Listen as he speaks and don't turn a deaf ear. I'm going to take and make two general observations before I get to verses 8 through 11. First, there is another dramatic change of mood here from the jubilant praise of the opening verses to the call of reverence in verse 6. Because we come now to the solemn warning that cannot be taken lightly. Second, there is a change in, in, in the speaker. In the first seven verses, the psalmist has spoken. Now we will hear from God, God himself. As he warns us against the dangers of a hard heart. Harden not your heart. Oh God. as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said it is a people that do err in their heart. And they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Essentially, what God wants is worship. What God wants in worship is that we would listen to his voice. It is more than just simply coming together to sing. He wants us to live out what we hear and be doers of the word. You see, when you're a worshiper, you're a doer of the word. It would be impossible for you to be a worshiper and ignorer of the world. There'll be something about a worshiper. You're going to be doing the things of God that are the tenets of being a believer. There's no way you're going to walk behind someone or by someone that you know needs God and not say something. It'd be impossible for you to ignore your neighbor when you're a worshiper. That's why we look at the entire service from the pre-service prayer all the way to the closing prayer of dismissal. It's all a part of our corporate worship. I refuse to be late for that because it's not just singing and times of singing. Part of worship is listening and responding to God's word as it's preached. When the altar call is given, if you're going to the bathroom, you missed it. And don't tell me you can sit in front of Facebook or go on a 10-hour drive or go shopping, but you can't sit through an hour and a half, two-hour service. The devil is a liar. Mm. I did. So at the close of this psalm, it's about worship. God warns us against the danger of having a hard heart. He does this by two events from Israel's past. What I never knew or realized until preparing for this message is that the words provocation and temptation in verse 8 are actually Hebrew names of places. Massa and Meribah. Listen to me. I know it's late, but don't shut it down. You need this. These were the places where Israel murmured and complained about the lack of water, and God gave it to them from a rock. These two accounts reveal a common problem in every generation. We can complain about the problems of the younger generation, but why don't we look at the one we're in right now? Let's look inward here for a minute. We're all prone to grumble and put God to the test. Are you hearing me? If the truth were known, each of us can be demanding of God. <laughs> as we try to coerce him to satisfy my wants. 
while it's not wrong to ask God for help, we do have to be careful about our complaining attitudes. Like Israel in the wilderness, our grumbling proves our lack of trust in God and definitely a lack of reverence. Your kid comes into the house and says, what? Peanut butter and jelly. What? Fried potatoes and hominy. Some of you get that one, some of you won't. You turn around and go, that's what I provided. You get your ungrateful, little unthankful carcass and sit down and eat it. Before I send you to the room you don't deserve. <laughs> hey, parents, we can't turn around and raise our kids without understanding and walk in the house of God and be belligerent. Hear a message preached and then stay in a seat or go to the bathroom and never darken the altar with worship and praise because God fed you. Massa and Meribah are historical events which expose a deep-seated and recurring tendency to become hardened in our hearts. That's why the psalmist said, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as at Massa. The word as indicates that it is a Massa-like attitude of the heart which God despises. Listen, life brings hard things. Hard words, hard choices, hard feelings, hard trials. But it doesn't have to produce a hard heart. One of the saddest situations is when folks who used to have that flowing worship, that flowing walk with God, who get hurt and shut it off. You can almost physically see the hardness of these people's hearts and it manifests itself in their countenance. You can feel it in their spirit. No real worship, all a little golf clap. It's cute. It's often almost impossible to even reach out to them and pray for them. They avoid that. It's like a heart disease. It slowly hardens out any chance of spiritual blood flow and they become shells of their former selves and they become embittered, embattled, and stagnant. But we can help from bent our heart from getting hard if we'll be passionate worshipers because he's worthy. Let's stand. If I'll be a passionate worshiper, in all honesty, my ability to read, my ability to study, my ability, I am not here for any of those things. I'm going to tell you why I'm still here. Because he's worthy. And I never let anything steal that from me. I've been through hell and high water. And it all boiled down to one thing. I realized I am not going to stop worshiping God because of what I'm going through. Because no matter what I'm going through, he is still worthy. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job teaches us an amazing part of worship that I am not about to let go of my worship because of what I'm going through. I can go through hardship, but I don't need to get a hard heart. We should worship both by our rejoicing and by our reverence. You should, anybody ever, anybody ever talk out loud too much while someone's speaking and everybody look at you? It's because there's a lack of reverence. There are certain things that we know are a lack of reverence, yet we've, because, because secular church is invaded here, we allow people to walk in and out and do all sorts of things. And there's, there's been a lack of reverence. It doesn't, you're okay walking in after pre-service prayer start because you don't think you're involved. Understand, it's not about the church or what you're doing being worthy. It's about him being worthy. And we, it, we must restore reverence, but we must also worship God by a response of obedience. You see, you couldn't have, teach something to your children at home or ever teach something or in the church or something and then turn around and change what it means now that I'm older. I'm not going to lift my hands because I got a, a tour. 
forgot what he told me yesterday. Rotator cuff. Oh, well, I don't want to get down on my knees. It hurts. Man, I crawled underneath the car last week. Are you hearing me? You see, worship without obedience is worthless to God. And verse 10 makes it very clear. Forty long years, forty years long was I grieved with this generation. That tells me you, you can be coming to church for a long time and God be grieved with you. And said it is a people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways. You can come a long time and be wrong. Failure to worship through our obedience causes our hearts to harden and is repulsive to God and destructive to us. In his book, Aqua Church, Leonard Sweet points out that we like to sing and praise God, but we often don't want to go beyond that. He writes, our, 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 our pews are occupied by people who want to be moved, but who don't want to move. Declare tonight, let, can I say like the psalmist, let us make sure that our worship always leads to action. Let us come to Souls Harbor Church not wanting to be moved, but committed to move. 